let's continue. Okay. So what I want to do uh, during this session is provide you, I guess, with a fun practical tool for understanding yourself and others. Because um, at the end of the day, end of the day, we've all been in situations where we've had a personality clash, and often the reason we've had a personality clash is pretty much because we see the world differently from the other person. And that's where the clash comes in. Um, personality, the word personality, comes from the Greek word persona. And persona really means mask. So basically a personality is a mask. So we've all got this mask that we wear every day. And what this mask actually does is it protects us from the world. So we process the world through this mask. So some people process this world through this mask by being organised and other people process this mask by being um, in charge. Other people process this mask by being conflict averse. Others process this mask by being fun and engaging. So we all do this in our own way. Sometimes we're aware of it, sometimes we're not. And what I, what I suggest to you is that when you're under pressure and when I'm under pressure, what actually happens is our mask gets thicker. So in other words, you know, because we're in a vulnerable position, the uh, traits of our personality are accentuated. So in other words, if you, want to, if you want to see somebody and what their true personality is like, then the best time to do that is when they're under pressure because obviously they're exaggerating the traits that are there to protect themselves and the rest of the world. So um, I guess it raises a very interesting question. And the interesting question is, is personality something that, you know, we learn as we grow? So is it environmental? Or is personality something innate? Is it something that we're kind of born with? Now, the jury's out on this, and it really depends on which school of thought you listen to. I mean, there's, there's a school of thought that believes that really our personality is formed and shaped by the environment that we're in. There's another school of thought on the other end of the continuum that says that it's pretty much an innate characteristic of who we are. Not necessarily hereditary, but innate. And, of course, there's a third school of thought that says, well, hang on, personality is a bit of both. You know, in one sense, we're part of the environment, but on another sense, we're kind of born with certain attributes or certain traits. Um, I think it's fair to say that there is some innate personality that comes through with people, because if you look, you know, those of you who've got young children would realise that um, you know, your child's got a certain predisposition or a sort of certain personality very at a very young age. You know, some of them want to be very, some of them are very quiet, some of them are very loud. Um, you know, some of them are very organised, some of them are very disorganised. So you sort of think, well, I wonder where they got all that from. So you'd have to think that there's some innate, kind of, you know, some innate uh, aspect of personality that comes through. But nevertheless, as a leader, it's critically important for us to be able to deal with all the personalities and not just our own. It's very easy to deal with people who think like us because we know what they're thinking, we know how they're processing, and often what happens is um, it's very obvious and we get on quite well with them. But as we probably all realise, a good leader needs to surround themselves with a range of different perspectives in order to amplify and build their own capability. And that therein lies the problem because people that don't necessarily think like you and me, sometimes there's a clash. Sometimes it's because we just don't see eye to eye. Okay, so I'm going to run through um, and talk, well, I, I guess I've done the first bit. I've talked a little bit about personality. Um, I'm going to then talk a little bit around the personality traits that people have, and I'm going to talk about the application. So, what what might you do in order to enhance or improve your 
capability of dealing with the various personality groups. And then I'm going to finish up with the platinum rule. So I might just mention the platinum rule now. The platinum rule is treat people how they want to be treated. Now, the golden rule is treat people how you want to be treated. But I would suggest to you that you get a better result if you treat people how they want to be treated, which of course is difficult because it means we've got to be in a position of empathy a lot of the time. And that's not always a natural position for us to be in. But nevertheless, that's where a leader is going to get the best results, if they can be in sync with how other people might be thinking. Okay, now there are, there are thousands of personality profiles out there on the marketplace. Some good, some not so good, some with rigour, some not. And look, the one that I've given you is pretty straightforward. And, you know, I think you can do, you know, you, you've got the MBTI, um, you've got the brain dominance type personality indicators, you've got a range of them. I simply gave you one just to engage you in this conversation really today to give you a little bit of a thought about how you like to see things. I've used four animals and the reason for that is of course it's very, very easy to remember the traits of four animals. So essentially this is based on Carl Jung's work where Carl Jung saw a difference in personalities. And you know, we've got all sorts of labels that you'll hear. There's the disc profile and it goes on. So they all have some value in terms of your ability to understand yourself and apply that in, you know, with other people. So um, I'm going to run through a profile which focuses on these four animals, the peacock, the bull, the owl, and the lamb. So if you've done the profile that I sent you, uh, it would have perhaps given you a category that you would have fallen into. And you might have had a very dominant personality in one of those four areas, or perhaps they were fairly even. But nevertheless, um, it will help you when I go through these different definitions. All right, so how this works. Um, let me give you a little bit of an explanation as to how this simple model works. And then what, I'm, what I'll do is then I'll spend some time talking about each of the four personalities, which of course you can see in front of you now, and talk about some famous personalities that fit that mould. All right, so you've got four quadrants, and if you look up the top, you've got a continuum there around introversion and extroversion. So if you look at the owl and the lamb, they're more on the introverted side, and if you look at the bull and the peacock, they're more on the extroverted side. Now, there's a lot of rubbish that's written about introversion and extroversion, unfortunately, and let me try and dispel some of it. The only real genuine category or, or definition of introversion and extroversion that I know of is how you recharge your batteries. So when we're all a bit tired and a bit jaded, the question then is how do you recharge your batteries under those circumstances? Introverts will tend to recharge their batteries by being alone and self-contained. So obviously activities like reading, um, activities uh, such as perhaps watching television and not being disturbed, those are perhaps the characteristics that a, an introvert might use to recharge their batteries. So for example, if you're an introvert and you've spent all day with people, you will probably want to find solace in doing some individual activities. On the other hand, if you're an extrovert, you will recharge your batteries by being with and around other people. So you might get on the phone and talk to people and have a chat. Um, you know, you might uh, seek people out if you're in a, at a function or in the workplace and have a bit of a discussion with them. And by doing that, you reinvigorate yourself. Now, of course, many of you 
uh, in this broadcast may think, well, sometimes I'm an introvert, sometimes I'm an extrovert, and that's probably very true. You may well be in the middle in certain circumstances, you're one or the other, nothing wrong with that, it's just the way you are. But a quick way of you being able to determine your introversion and extroversion score is simply this. If you look at your survey results, if you've got them in front of you, if you add up your owl and lamb scores, that's the total for the owl and the lamb, that will give you an introvert score. And if you add up your bull and your peacock score, that will give you an extrovert score. And if you look at the totality of those two, it will give you an indication of whether you're more introvert or extrovert based on the survey that you completed about yourself. And uh, so, and that probably shouldn't surprise you, whatever that result is, but uh, it'll probably just confirm something you may already know about yourself. Now, the other myth, there's some other myths about introverts and extroverts that I want to dispel. One of the other myths is that, you know, uh, introverts aren't terribly good with dealing with people and extroverts are. That's a complete myth. Um, there are many, many leaders that I know who are introvert who are outstanding at dealing with people. Equally, I know many leaders who are extrovert in nature who are terrible at leading people. They just don't have the necessary people skills. So let's be clear that um, the whole idea of being a leader isn't necessarily um, you know, an extrovert trait. Just to, just to give you an idea, four out of 10 CEOs in Australia are actually introvert. So to get to the very top of leadership, which of course is a CEO position, okay, six out of 10 are, but four out of 10 are introvert. So it just gives you an idea that you don't need to be necessarily an extrovert. Um, people often say to me, can you change throughout your life? You know, do you, I was an introvert when I was in my 20s and now I'm an extrovert or vice versa. I don't actually think you do change. I think what actually happens is you learn to adapt. So what happens is that um, if you're introvert, you may have learnt that it's probably a good idea to speak up in meetings. So you force yourself to make contributions in meetings that you wouldn't normally make. And if you're an extrovert, you probably have learned to shut up in meetings and you've probably learned that it's not particularly helpful to be, to be dominating the conversation all the time. So these are learned behaviours and it doesn't necessarily mean that you've learned to become more introvert and extrovert, it simply means you just learnt to adapt through sheer experience. So I think there's a lot to that. Now the other um, frame or parameter that's quite important is the other dimension over here on the right hand side. If I can just get that up for you to see. Okay, so what you can see there is a split or a, di a dichotomy between task and people. So there's a general tendency that people who uh, have a an owl or a bull predisposition are likely to be more task oriented orientated than people oriented orientated. It doesn't mean they don't like people or that they don't think people are important, but they're just more focused on getting the task done as a priority. And you can see from the, the table there in front of you that the lamb and the peacock school, you know, the lamb and the peacock has an orientation towards people over task. So again, it doesn't mean that the lamb and the peacock doesn't see the value in achieving the task, of course they do, but they have a priority with who they're working with in order to achieve that task. So that's an important distinction, I think, um, that we need to make early on. So. Right, so now that basically brings us to the four personalities. So if we just populate the table, bear with me for a moment while we do that. You can see now that we have owls, bulls, 
lands and peacocks. And incidentally, if you want to know whether you're more task focused than people focused, all you need to do is to add up your owl and ball score, which will give you a task score. And then if you add up your lamb and your peacock score, that'll give you a people score. And it'll give you an idea about whether you're more task focused or people focused. Now the reality is we need to be focused on both if we're leaders, but it's just a good indication to see where you're at. Okay. All right. So now let's uh, let's continue and let's start to look at these four personality types. So peacocks. Then I just put all of this up and then we look. I went too far. All of this up and then let's talk about it. Okay, so the Peacock personality, and those of you that have the high score in the Peacock personality, I'll give you a primary motivation, which is around being popular. Now, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that all Peacocks are popular, but the motivation is, of course, to maintain that popularity. They like to be liked. I guess one of the drawbacks of a Peacock leader is that sometimes they have to make tough decisions which don't necessarily endear them to their team or colleagues. And uh, that can be quite challenging for the peacock. Um, the characteristics overall are they are quite extrovert. They like to talk and often that's how they think. So you'll often hear peacocks saying things like, I'm just thinking aloud, which essentially means that you know, their, their talk is around thinking, which is very puzzling to the introvert. They don't quite get that. And usually the peacock is an optimist. So in their mind, the glass is half full, not half empty. So basically they will see the world as a, as a, as a myriad of opportunity more than anything else. And so, you know, a lot of their energy comes from being optimistic about the world and so forth. So if that rings true to you, then, then there you go. And um, so they're great strengths. And I think if you think about them as a leader, people like working with them because they've got an appealing, engaging personality. They're often very creative and colourful. They've often got the latest joke and, uh, you know, they, they, they can often... Uh, do a lot of good with keeping morale high. They've got usually a lot of energy and enthusiasm and get up and go. And generally speaking, I think people find them inspiring and they, of course, like to think of themselves as quite inspiring as well. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. So you can imagine as a leader, they're going to be fun to work with, perhaps not terribly structured, but certainly with lots of energy and people orientation and, you know, very motivating in many ways. So famous people, well, we, you know, um, Paris Hilton, uh, I'm, I'm trying to give a balance between male and female here in all of these presentations. So Paris Hilton, um, I always thought it was quite amusing how Paris Hilton, I don't know whether you remember, but quite a few years ago she ended up in jail, I don't think it was for very long, but she ended up in jail, and uh, she saw that as a publicity stunt, and uh, basically told the whole world about it. I don't know about you and I, uh, I don't know about her, but I know that I certainly, if I spent time in jail, I wouldn't be inclined to tell anybody. They may find out, but they're certainly not going to find out from me. So anyway, extrovert. And then, of course, the Scottish comedian who I find hilarious, most people do, is Billy Conley. Now, you know, when you watch Billy Conley on television, or if you've had the good fortune to see him in person live, uh, there's not a lot of structure there. It certainly doesn't appear to be. Uh, he will go off on a tangent very, very readily. And uh, you never know quite where it's going to end. So um, there's two personalities that definitely fit the mould of, uh, of the extroverted peacock. So um, their motto, if we could sum it up in a couple of words, would be any publicity is good publicity. So the whole idea is that uh, 
you, you people are talking about me, it's a fantastic thing. Um, so your classic prototype Hollywood movie star would clearly be in that ilk of being a peacock. In other words, they'd be quite depressed if they weren't being talked about at all. Forget about what they're being, what, forget about what the news is. The fact that they're not being, they're not in the news would be a real issue for the peacock. Now I'm exaggerating all these things of course and those of you who are peacocks are probably sitting there thinking, oh well some of that's me but not all of it. And if you look in your survey, you'll notice I've given you a couple of pages to give you a bit of an idea of some of the characteristics of these personalities. And of course it very much depends on your score. Um, so if you had a very high score, then obviously all the things that I'm sharing with you would be very relevant. But if you're only marginally a peacock, maybe not. So that gives you a bit of an idea of that person. I'm sure you've got people in your team that exhibit those traits, if not yourself. All right, let's move on. Okay, let's have a look at the bull. Um, the bull, uh, and again, the bull, Prime, and of course they're extroverted and task focused. The bull's primary motivation is being powerful. Now again, they're not always in powerful positions, but they certainly strive to feel that they're in charge. Their great insecurity is of people taking advantage of them. They don't like that, so therefore they like to be on the front foot and uh, be able to uh, make sure that they're in a situation of dominance. They're usually extrovert, in fact they always are extrovert, they're outgoing and uh, people would definitely call them doers. So if you wanted a job done, uh, you'd give it to a bull. It may not be done as thoroughly as you like, but it will be done. And again, like the, like the peacock, they're optimists. So what happens is they will look at things from a glass half full perspective. Um, and, uh, you know, they will, as a leader, will feel quite naturally inclined to leadership. Now, when I put down here the strengths, as one of them would be a born leader, let's not get too carried away with that. I'm not suggesting for a minute that these people um, are necessarily the best leaders. What I'm saying there is that as a leader, they feel the most comfortable in the leadership role of all four personalities. Why? Because they naturally want to be in control. Whereas the other three personalities may feel some sense of insecurity about that at times, not the bull. They actually think it's their divine right to be in control. Doesn't mean they are a wonderful leader though. Um, they're very, very focused on outcome. So one of the worst things that you can do with the bull is talk to them about the nitty gritty. If you get down to tin tacks and talk detail, they're not really impressed. Um, they just want to know what the bottom line is. In fact, they'll often use that term. They'll just say, what is the bottom line? So they're very good at setting targets and very good at aiming for those targets. But in terms of the process of how we get to those targets, that's probably not something that's their forte. So if you're a bull, you'll probably completely relate to that. Um, they do move quickly into action. They're not into chit chat and small talk. Quite frankly, what they need, what they want to do in their world is get on and get results, which is critically important to them. So um, two famous people that we all know, uh, one of course is in the news a lot now, uh, is Hillary Clinton one of the two presidential candidates in the US and the other one is Madonna, the, uh, the entertainer. And both of them have completely taken control of their careers. Both of them have been highly successful and both of them in their own way are quite dominant personalities. And uh, you know, that's the sort of, uh, that's the personality trait. Um, their motto in life is that I'm in control and willing to lead. 
So they feel very comfortable in that leadership role and will often gravitate to those roles. I'm sure, again, you've got people in your team who very much fit that bill. And we'll talk in a minute about what, what you can do to lead them more effectively. Okay, let's just get up all of the categories for the next category, which is the OWL. Okay, you can see it on your screen now. Now the OWL, as a personality, um, the difference here is that the OWL is task-focused like the bull, but that they are more introvert than extrovert. So their primary motivation is being perfect, and again, they probably never strive to be perfect, but perfectionism is a double-edged sword for the OWL. They aim for it all the time, but of course they never arrive. The perfection is just out of reach. Um, sometimes it takes a lot to convince an owl of that too, by the way. But the owl is essentially an introvert. They are a thinker. And in fact, they're often a deep thinker. So what happens is they think very deeply about things. Um, and more so than the average person. And they usually look at things as a glass half empty, not half full. So they're very good at risk aversion. So they're very good at um, weighing up risk and building contingencies around it. Um, you know, that's just their orientation. So good at problem solving, I guess that's probably a more practical way of putting it. So they love schedules. In fact, um, it's very common for owls to plan their day out. The to-do list is, a, uh, is their constant companion. They will maybe use Google Calendar and uh, fill in all the spaces and colour code things day to day, plan out each day as it comes. And they really don't value people that aren't as schedule oriented as they are. So if you organise a meeting with an owl and you're half an hour late or worse have forgotten the meeting, the owl will not be impressed because they're so schedule oriented themselves. They usually have very high standards of themselves and of other people. And um, this can be a double-edged sword again because the owl is always striving to be their very best, but they can also they also expect everybody else to be like that. So they make tough parents, they make tough leaders as well. Um, the crossbar is always high. They're very orderly and systematic and organised, and they probably may not see themselves that way, but other people definitely see them that way. So if you think about a couple of famous personalities that fit that mould, you'd have to think Roger Federer, the tennis player. He is an absolute perfectionist in terms of the way he plays the game. And another one would be Leonardo da Vinci, even though of course he's not around today. You probably, um, as you look down on the cast your eyes down at the bottom right hand, part of the slide. I'm sure at school you would have seen the sketches of Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, absolutely brilliant in their detail. And uh, the story goes that Leonardo da Vinci used, you know, in those days, actually would go into a graveyard. I'm sure they didn't have permits in those days. But he'd go into a graveyard and he'd dig up the uh, remains, the human remains of the bodies. And what he did is he would be looking and studying the muscular structure because he wanted to get it absolutely right in his drawings and sketches. So if ever they were a perfectionist, it would be Leonardo da Vinci. So their motto, or the, the, the owl's motto, is I can paint, how do I paint this perfect picture? It's always about perfection. They do have an artistic streak to them. Um, probably quite good with numbers and data as well. So uh, usually an owl can be quite artistic or quite numeric depending on you know who they are. So 
have a think about yourself in that regard. Okay, moving right along to the next one, or the next uh, particular uh, personality. If I can put it up there, you'll see it shortly. There we go. The lamb. Now, um, let's talk about the lamb personality as a leader as well. Their primary motivation is being peaceful. Now, again, two people on a desert island, there won't always be peace. But the lamb is always striving for peace. So what they're trying to do is to minimise, reduce and avoid conflict. So they're, they're the peacemaker, if you like. They're the ones that very much try to maintain harmony in a team or a group and can be very effective at it too, I might say, which of course is a great attribute to have in the workplace. So their primary characteristics are introvert, so very much like the... Um, like the owl, they're a watcher rather than a thinker, so they tend to watch other people. And once they have uh, assessed that, then they'll often contribute. So in a meeting, for example, it's not unusual for a lamb to wait and watch and observe the contributions of their team members around the table, and then right at the end, they'll make a contribution after watching and assessing the other contributions that people make. So they're not going to make a huge amount of noise in meetings. But generally speaking, they're pessimists. So often I find lambs have got quite a, um, a dry sense of humour, quite um, droll, if you like. Their, their great strengths are that they are very competent and steady. So if you give a lamb a job, it might get done in a split second, but it will get done, and it will get done well, assuming, of course, that they're happy to do it. They are normally very peaceful and agreeable, so they're not terribly confrontational, and uh, people like to be around them because they feel comfortable in their presence. And they're very good at mediating problems. So if two people in a team are having a bit of an altercation, the lamb is extremely good at being able to take both sides and to be able to, you know, to sort it out and to kind of empathise with both sides. So they become very good at doing that as such. So a lamb as a leader is an easygoing, friendly uh, person who uh, accomplishes things with and through their team. They're a great person to work with and they're often good at building the team up. Two famous people that I thought would fit this bill nicely was Keanu Reeves, the actor, who, um, who we would know is a reasonably quiet, reserved actor, which is unusual for Hollywood. Uh, but, uh, of course, he started some great films, The Matrix and a few other films, but he's quite quiet and he leads, he leads from all accounts, a very modest life, considering the fact that he's probably worth millions and millions of dollars. And the other one is another actor too, Kirsten Stewart. <clears throat> you don't hear much about her either, and she keeps pretty much to herself. And uh, you know, she's a lamb. She's she she will uh, be, uh, from all reports, an easy person to work with. Um, you know, and quite compliant, gets the job done and so forth. So really, they're, they're, uh, if you look at the land's motto in life, it's very much peace is the overriding objective. So that's how they process the world. All right, so there's the four personalities, and uh, hopefully if you've done the uh, survey, it would put you in one of those categories. Um, and what I want to do now is, I won't spend much time on this, I just wanted to show you one of these typical um, exercises that people have in workshops. So this is an exercise where you're lost at sea and you've got to determine, you know, the, the, the boat catches fire and you're in, in on board and you have to, um, you know, collect some resources and go to a dinghy and rescue yourself and, and also survive at the same time. We've all probably done these exercises in workshops. 
I don't want to resolve this exercise right here, right now, but I really want to just point out that the four personalities would bring different orientations to this exercise. All right, so the, um, so the um, peacock would probably, uh, you know, be looking around and looking at who's fun to work with in the group, and they'd probably um, have a fair bit of chit-chat before they got down to sorting out this. They'd probably go all over the shop, not have a great methodology, but at the end of the day, they'd probably get it all done and think to themselves, gee, that was fun. The bulls, on the other hand, would probably all do it themselves as a group, so they'd all, because they're self-opinionated, they'd all have their own view about what comes first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and then they'd all compare notes, and uh, they'd probably argue about whether they were right or whether the other person was wrong. So, and the bulls would all see it as a challenge, get the job done, because that's what we're asked to do. The owls, on the other hand, would want to ask a million questions about what does a sextant do? How big is the shaving mirror? Um, is the five-gallon can of water uh, got a, you know, a lid on it? And, it? and on and on it goes because they're perfectionists and they want to do the right thing. So their challenge in resolving this problem would be to get the perfect answer. And finally, the lambs would all... Um, basically wait for other people in the group to talk. Um, they might even have a vote around the group to work out what would be one, what would be two, what would be three, and so forth, because they wouldn't want to be offensive to each other. So you can see that uh, every role and job that we do in life can be governed by our personality traits, and leadership is no different. So let's just finish up today and talk about some of the things that are critically important for uh, you dealing with the four personalities. So if you're dealing with peacocks in your team, the first thing you probably should recognise is that they do have a challenge in following through. So you need to constantly remind them of what the deadlines are or the tasks you require because they need that. Uh, Realise that sometimes they talk without first thinking, so they're actually not trying to offend people. But because they think out loud, they're, most, they're the most prone to foot in mouth. So it's quite likely that they'll say some stupid things from time to time because they haven't thought through very carefully what they're going to say. Realise that they thrive on variety and flexibility. So if you can give these people a sense of variety and flexibility in their work, they will really appreciate that and their energy levels will be quite high. Try not, don't expect them to remember appointments necessarily to be on time. Uh, they're easily distracted. They're quite dynamic in the way they work. It's not a personal thing, it's just who they are. And I think the other point I'd make is be prepared to listen to their stories. And I say that because they'll always have some stories. They'll always have a joke, they'll always have a story. And uh, you just need to listen to that. And after you've done that, they'll be quite responsive and open to listening to what you have to say, which is probably get back to work. So that's the peacock. What about the powerful bull? What might be some of their traits? Okay. So if you've got a bull in your team, recognise that they're comfortable leading. So the whole idea is if you can give them a sense of responsibility, they will take it up. So they'll be quite comfortable in that role. So if you can give people a sense of accountability and responsibility, they will take it. That's one of the great strengths of the bull. Insist on two-way communication. You may find that occasionally the bull will start to, uh, to take over. You know, they'll start to um, basically involve themselves in things that they perhaps shouldn't involve themselves in. So it's very important to be firm with them occasionally. So let them know where the line in the sand is. because, And in fact, if you do that, they will appreciate that because they need to be, you know, they need to be told where the line in the sand is constantly. Otherwise, they will. You give them an inch and they'll take a mile. 
Why? Because they like to be in charge. They're not actually trying to be offensive. They just believe that if there's a vacuum there, in other words, a decision's not been made, they will get in and make it. Know that they don't mean to hurt. They're not in a chit-chat, small talk, so it's no point in you trying to engage in that with the bull. Just get straight to the point and be firm with them and they'll appreciate your efficiency. And realise that they're not noted for their outward displays of compassion. They still have feelings. They just know that if they display them too uh, openly, it puts them in a vulnerable position. And the bull being wanting to be in charge and in control does not want to put themselves into a vulnerable position. So, you know, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an understanding about how to lead them. Now, the owl, which I think is probably the hardest personality to manage because they're the most sensitive. Of all the four personalities, the owl is the most sensitive. So what do I mean by that? Well, they do get hurt easily. Why? Because they analyse everything that's said. I was working with someone the other day who said to me, I came to work the other day and someone said hello to me. And I said, yeah. And they said, they said hello to me. They've never done that before. I said, well, maybe they're just in a good mood that day. No, there's something going on. I don't quite understand it, but it's not, I don't get it. So you can see that the owl can overanalyze things. So clearly they'll get hurt because they'll misinterpret or, or put an interpretation on it that's not quite correct. Realize that they're programmed to look at things through a, a risk assessment. Um, and that can be good if it's managed the right way, but they'll often be the ones negative in meetings. But, they, but they're not negative for the sake of it. They've actually thought it through but they thought it through to the point where they can see um, what some of the problems are. So if you can harness that, it's a good thing. Be prepared to answer their questions and to do it thoroughly. They expect, they don't want waffle. They want people to have considered thorough answers to their questions. And uh, be to try to keep a reasonable schedule. They don't appreciate sloppiness. The whole idea is if you have promised to meet them at two o'clock this afternoon, then you better jolly well meet them at two o'clock this afternoon because that's the way they think. Whereas with a, mat, with a peacock, that's not going to be a worry. That just means sometime this afternoon. Realise that their arguments, your arguments and opinions have to be backed up with substance. They'll probably ask you a million questions and annoy the living daylights out of you. They just want to know the answers. They are a sucker for lots and lots of information. And finally, the, the lamb, peaceful lamb. What can you do with the peaceful lamb? Well, um, there it is. It's up on your screen now. Now, the peaceful lamb realise that they need. You need to be clear about the direct. They need to be clear about the direction you're heading in. Now, what I mean by that is that you need to set them some very clear targets and deadlines. They will appreciate that make sure, of course, that they're realistic. Uh, help them set agreed upon targets. So um, lambs are not natural goal setters. Um, so it's important to set some big picture targets for them to aim at and then to get their agreement that they will meet those targets. Because once you get their agreement, they won't want to disappoint you because that in itself can be a conflict situation and they wouldn't want to put themselves into that situation. So don't always expect uh, them to show outward signs of enthusiasm. Not likely. Um, they, wear, they play their cards very close to their chest. And interesting enough, they can be very, very stubborn. The bulls can be stubborn too, and often you'll know that the bull is stubborn because they'll just tell you that they're not doing something. But the lamb won't tell you that because that will create conflict. So what they'll do is quietly put something in the too hard basket. And what will happen is a week will go by and two weeks will go by and the job hasn't been done um, because they're quietly protesting. That's their way of maintaining control. So realise that, as I said there, on the page in front of you, that realising that putting things off is their quiet form of control. 
So the, cru the cru crucial thing when you're dealing with a land is to look for mutual commitments. Clarify what they're going to do, what you need to do, and then they'll be happy because they'll know where they stand with you. Um, and lambs can be very good workers if they've got some clarity around what your expectations are and you do it in a peaceful, collaborative way, they will appreciate that. So there's the four personalities. So my um, suggestion to you is to have some fun with this. Have a look around this afternoon at your team. Think about their personality traits and then try to deal with them according to how they want to be dealt with. And in fact, this is the summary slide of the whole presentation and it's really, really important. And, you know, we've all heard the golden rule. The golden rule is a rule about treating people how you want to be treated. And I think, you know, there's a certain sense of uh, truth to that, of course. I mean, what that really means is that we all want to be respected, so therefore show people a sense of respect. But the golden rule only goes so far. If you take personality into consideration, which is a form of diversity, so think about personality as a form of diversity. We bang on about diversity now, diversity of religion, diversity of the sexes, diversity in terms of age. We talk about this regularly, but we very rarely talk about diversity of the way we think. Well, personality is that type of diversity. So the key for you is to treat people how they want to be treated. So if you're dealing with a peacock, um, you don't have to become a peacock. Just understand that they have a certain orientation and try to mould and meld your personality to meet that. If you're dealing with a bull, same thing, an owl, same thing, and a, and, a, and a lamb. So you'll find that you'll get better results by doing that because you're actually showing the ultimate form of respect, which is around treating people how they want to be treated, which I think is the ultimate sign of respect. Okay, so what's your homework? What do we? What do we? What do? What do you need to do out of our uh, little broadcast today? Well, I just want you to have some fun with this and try to approach the people you lead with an emphasis on their personality type. All right. So if you're having difficulty with one person in your team, uh, I'm not saying it's the reason, but it could be that you're treating them according to how you want to be treated rather than treating them how they want to be treated. So have a think for a minute. What sort of personality are they? What could you do differently as a result of getting a better result? And have some fun with this and watch carefully and see whether you actually are making inroads with your team. Because at the end of the day, um, as I've said, as a theme running through this program, leaders are in the business of getting the best out of their people. And one of the ways of getting the best out of people is, of course, to treat people how they want to be treated. So that's your homework. And uh, I'm very keen to hear how you get on. So send me an email. Let me know uh, because it's always of interest. And finally, last slide. Um, there's the program. We will, in November, on November the 11th, we will look at uh, facilitating effective meetings and I'll have a few things to say about that. I honestly believe that one of the critical competencies that any leader should have and one of the most underrated competencies is their ability to lead, sense, you know, to, to chair or to run successful meetings. So we'll focus on that in Module 6. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I've enjoyed working with you again. Uh, bear with me. I've got a couple of days before I send out the slides and the video recording. Um, but by all means, I encourage you to keep in contact with me. Um, any sort of feedback is greatly appreciated. So thank you very much.